The Joint Special Operations University Office for Strategic Engagement is proud to present Think JSO, the 2022 National Security Strategy and Interagency Cooperation. Before we get started, please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed are those of the presenters and may not necessarily be the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, U.S. Department of State, U.S. Department of Energy, the National Nuclear Security Agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development, United States Special Operations Command, Joint Special Operations University, or Interaction. This panel discussion and associated chat is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSOW network. Moderating today's panel is Dr. Kurt Herrick. Dr. Herrick served on active duty for nearly 25 years before retiring in 2007 as a Special Forces Chief Warrant Officer for. He joined JSOW in May 2010 and currently serves as a professor of GMC studies and interagency program manager within the Department of International and GMC Education and Engagement. He holds a Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership and Management, is a certified higher education professional in teaching, online teaching, and leadership, and he's a JSOW Master Instructor. Thank you for serving as our moderator today, Dr. Herrig. The floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Clarissa. So hello and welcome to our discussion on the 2022 National Security Strategy and Interagency Cooperation. This webinar is in support of JSAL's Soft Support to Resilience and Resistance Learning Pathway and our own interagency education program. This morning, we're going to dive into the recently published National Security Strategy and discuss many of the topic areas that the president has deemed strategically important to the overall security of the United States, our people, and our way of life. The question we'll ask today is, what is the significance of the national security strategy and how can the interagency better collaborate in this era of strategic competition? We will further discuss what this strategy means to several of our interagency partners, the DOD, USOCOM, and the commercial sector in the form of non-governmental organizations. I am joined this morning by the following panel members for today's discussion. Ms. Jennifer Marin. Jennifer currently serves as the Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Interaction, the largest alliance of international non-governmental organizations in the United States, where she leads Interaction's team to shape and coordinate coalition policy and advocacy efforts related to the US government. Say hello, Jennifer. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, Mr. Peter Cloutier. Peter is a career U.S. agency for international development or USAID foreign service officer, currently serving as professor of development and human security and USAID chair at the Joint Special Operations University. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Excellent. Mr. John Mongan. John is a senior stabilization advisor in the Department of State's Bureau of Conflict Stabilization and Reconstruction. John? Morning, all. And rounding out our panel is Mr. Dallas Boyd. Dallas currently serves as a senior advisor in the National Nuclear Security Administration's NNSA, Office of Counterterrorism and Counterproliferation at the Department of Energy, focused on nuclear counterterrorism and counterproliferation. Dallas? Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Welcome to you all, and thank you for being with us this morning. We really would like to hear from our audience and include your voice in the conversation. So ask questions, share comments, even challenge our ideas. Please use the chat function in the lower center of your screen to pose a question or include comments. So the national security strategy, first of all, is required by law. It's codified in Title 50 of U.S. Code. And the requirement is that a, uh, a new president must publish a national security strategy within his first or his or her, excuse me, first 150 days of the presidency. It's prepared by the executive branch of government for Congress and outlines major national security concerns of the United States and how the administration plans to address them using all instruments of national power. What we see now is a visual representation of the number of times a word was used in President Biden's 2022 national security strategy 
or otherwise known as a word cloud. The larger the fonts in the word cloud, the more times that word was used throughout the document. What we can take away from this glance is there is much more emphasis on international, world, and global throughout the document than in the 2017 National Security Strategy under President Trump. We'll begin by removing United and States. Let's see what differences emerge. In the 2017 National Security Strategy, we see references to partners, world, and allies. In the 2022 National Security Strategy, we see expanded discussion and occurrences of world partners, global, international, allies, shared, and countries. The comparison of the two word clouds is an indication of policy shifts under President Biden's administration. So let's begin our dissection of what this national security strategy means to our panel members. So in a very general sense, uh, the first question I'd like to ask is, you know, how does national security strategy influence your organization in areas such as mission priorities, budgets, resources, new policies, and strategies? And I'll just begin on the DOD side. So for the Department of Defense, that national security strategy outlines the, the national secu security interests of the United States, according to the president. So using the military instrument of national power, the secretary of defense then develops the national defense strategy, which aligns with those strategic priorities. In turn, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs publishes the national military strategy. And within DOD, everything just tumbles down all the way to that theater level for, for strategic planning. So if I could just ask each of our panel members, what does this thing mean to you or your organization? Uh, John, what do you think, sir? Um, so thanks a lot, Kurt. Uh, that's a really interesting question to ask. You know, in the grand scheme of things, most people at the State Department whom I've encountered, and if there are others in the chat, um, you know, it'd be good to hear from them at some point, but the national security strategy doesn't come up very much in State Department budgeting conversations. It's, it's important to remember that the strategy comes out when the strategy comes out, whereas the budget, the budget process cycle is fixed. And at least at state, it's also bottom up. So uh, our missions in countries develop their country strategies with their associated budget requests. Those get sent to Washington. Regional bureaus combine those together into a regional budget request. Functional bureaus put in their own functional bureau requests. Um, those all get consolidated into a State Department budget. How many people at different times in that process look at the existing national security strategy, assuming it came out in a timeline where it's relevant to that process, is an open question. Um, the budget process really, to me, is a more guiding strategic document than the national security strategy itself. And you'll note there is no I know there's a national defense strategy and a national military strategy. There isn't a national diplomatic strategy. Um, Secretary Clinton, uh, you know, at one point uh, led with what she called a quadrennial diplomacy and development review. I think that was picked up one time by Secretary Kerry and it was not continued afterwards. It also, it derived somewhat from the national security strategy at the time, uh, but it also was not explicitly linked to the budget process. I, I, I think it's, from a state perspective, best to view national security strategies as communications documents. They are documents we expect other governments to read to get a sense of where we're coming from and what we're really prioritizing. You know, I, I think other governments probably look through national security strategies just as much for what's not in them as, as for what they say. And I'll, I'll shut up there and pass it off to someone else to have a good comment. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that. Uh, Dallas. Yeah, so... Um... I guess what I would say is in terms of spinning up the machine and, and kind of moving, you know, my office or my agency in a, in a wholly different direction, the national security strategy does not do that. But that's not to say that, you know, it, it isn't important and, and influential. What it does do is a, perform a kind of affirmative function, which is to say that these kind of fundamental missions that we perform with respect to nonproliferation, counterproliferation, nuclear counterterrorism and so on 
are enduring requirements where the work that we do really doesn't change very much from administration to administration. And that's a good thing. There's continuity uh, in the work that we do. And, you know, this is important that that kind of um, that marker, that imprimatur of, of the administration saying that this is an important mission. That's important, and particularly in the current context where, you know, everyone talks about the resumption of um, great power competition, where we are forever concerned that in a kind of zero sum allocation of, of resources that, uh, you know, nuclear counterterrorism, for example, which is a relatively niche mission, will kind of be swept by the wayside. Um, there hasn't been a major uh, terrorist attack on U.S. soil in over 20 years. Uh, the concern that people once had very acutely about nuclear terrorism has has waned to some extent. It's just not something that you see in the news very often. And yet these really fundamental uh, mission requirements, locking down nuclear material, paying attention to uh, non-state actors uh, pursuing or expressing interest in nuclear weapons, those, you know, that work continues day in and day out forever. I mean, that nuclear material, you know, with half-lives measured in, you know, millennia, it's always going to be a potential for malicious use. And so we have to just keep doing this stuff over and over and over again in perpetuity. So to have that mission kind of ratified and reaffirmed in the national security strategy is very important to us so that we can point to it and say, you know, we always have to do this. Over. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for that. And, and I, I did, you know, I appreciate your point that, you know, due to the niche mission in the area that you work on, that it is fairly consistent uh, throughout throughout these uh, national security priorities. Thank you, sir. Uh, what do you say, Jenny? Well, thank you. And thank you for having me uh, here today. You know, I'm a little bit of the odd duck out on this panel because I'm not sitting in the executive branch, right? Um, I, I'm sitting in a coalition of NGOs and as such, therefore, you know, the national security strategy doesn't directly influence uh, our organization's priorities. It doesn't directly influence uh, the, the priorities of our members, but it, there is a lot of alignment between what interactions members work on and what we see in this national security strategy, right? I think, you know, we always want to be, uh, we're always a little bit wary of over securitization of development issues. But I think what's notable about this strategy is just how much of the shared global challenges, shared transnational challenges, are ones of development and how this uh, strategy really frames security. It recognizes the importance of development of security. And I'll say I've had a number of conversations with folks in the State Department over the past years who consider themselves more hardcore foreign policy people who, uh, you know, maybe looked a little askance at, at, at development programs. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's nice over there. And now, particularly with seeing the impacts of Ukraine and seeing the global food security crisis and what it has done um, around the world, it, oh, yes, this stuff really matters. People learned a lot about fertilizer really fast and where it moves and where it hasn't got to and what that's gonna to do to our ability to put food on the table at reasonable prices. And so I, I think the recognition of those issues in the strategy is really important and really important to our, our organizations because a lot of what we're doing is, again, talking to both the administration and to Congress about why these issues matter, um, not just around the world, but to the American people. And um, so this, there's a lot of alignment here in the work that we've always been doing. So I'll pause there. Thank you very much for, Jen, for that, Jenny. I, I appreciate that perspective coming from our commercial uh, sector. So thank you. And uh, lastly, uh, Peter, USAID. Well, great. Um, first of all, just to echo thanks to, to you, Kurt, Clarissa, and Rob for, for thinking about this and undertaking it. Uh, it's an honor to be here and with this with this great panel. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rival the the odd duck um, uh, award uh, with Jenny and really piggyback on what she said. And um, you know, I'm gonna start with a bit upstream of the NSS and then try and get all the way down to examples of, of uh, you know, sort of this value add idea, I think, or notion with, with USAID and how that's actually competitive. But um, so first of all, you know, Joint Special Operations University President, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson often begins, um, you know, often begins his presentations with this notion of compound security dilemmas. 
and the root causes above them that, that create the dilemmas. Um, and that how, you know, without, without uh, better uh, measures to address them, they become threats. Um, and then he often ends talking about and what we need are compound security solutions. And I think this gets to what, Jen, what Jenny was talking about, that um, security and development um, are, not, are not only um, interrelated, but they're codependent. Um, and we, it's easy, I think, as we have historically done to think, well, I mean, you need a certain degree of security in place in order for development to function. But we don't always think that development and certain development factors need to be in place in order for, sec for security to, 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 to be present. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I like to say, you know, as the doublement uh, bubblegum advertisement, double the pleasure, double the fun. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, that's good when it's good and it's horrible when it's bad. And so I think that's why you see USAID on the National Security Council now for reasons that, that Jenny just talked about and, and for what I just talked about. So anyway, so now let me try and get down into sort of the, the meat and potatoes of some of the things that USAID does that actually may be more off the radar. But let's pick uh, you know, a, a few mission priorities. I'm going to read these straight from the Joint Strategic Plan. Renew U.S. leadership and mobilize coalitions to address the global challenges that have the greatest impact on America's security and well-being. One of those, strengthen global health security. So, and I think about uh, you know the work that that uh, that I was a part of in Mozambique, unfunded, um, and that, an initiative in which the Mozambique Institute of National Health um, was a sort of co-lead in a months-long, if not years-long, process in developing their their health security strategy. You know, the idea, what ended up happening there was, you know, they, first of all, they took the initiative to do this all sort of on their own. They asked us for advice, the U.S. government, they asked us for advice, and, and we weighed in jointly with, with CDC. You know, we talked about how that could be a unified approach, and that can be challenging at times, but it worked. Um, and as we found ourselves participating in a lot of panels where our own subject matter expertise, not just from, not just from our, our health offices, but from others, agriculture, economic growth that are participating in this and adding value and perspective. So again, this is an unfunded initiative um, that the Mozambicans took on. And I think they, you know, and they think about that, kids, particularly when we use terms like influence in, in this competitive realm, um, the type of influence that that, 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 that engenders, right? Um, Lancet article, just, I was back in the United States at this time, early 2000s, Lancet's like the New England Journal of Medicine equivalent in England. You know, they have this sort of ranking data analysis on countries' preparations for, um, for lack of a better word, for COVID. And there's Mozambique sitting above the Senegals and the Ghanas of other sub-Saharan African countries. And you think, you know, they did it on their own. And, and I think they recognize that they did it on their own. All right, another, uh, another, another priority, promote global prosperity and shape an international environment in which the United States can thrive. Underneath that, strengthen U.S. and global resilience to economic, technological, environmental, and other systemic shocks. And I think about the work that the U.S. government did um, and collaborated on in, in Angola, the early part of the last decade, where you know, we're working with uh, often across the table conversations that develop into, you know, public financial management, you know, how can we actually in, improve that on the road to more transparent and accountable governance? And we look at, okay, well, there's a treasury advisor that sits in the Ministry of Finance, you know, how can we link these up? I'm working in, in the health sector, and we end up doing, supporting, you know, what the, what the Angolans really wanted to do in, in getting the real dollars and cents and valuations that they need for, for, for budgeting. We partner with the university uh, in, in the United States. We spend a fraction um, compared to the Angolans on the endeavor. And you look at this 10 years later, you look at the MCC control of corruption indicator for, for Angola, it's gone up. And these people that we worked with back then who were more junior at the time, they're in ministerial positions and national director positions now. So, um, you know, talk about influence, you know, we've got it. I know, are we, are, we, are we capturing it? It's another question. All right, the final one here, I know I'm taking a little bit long here, but um, strengthen democratic institutions, uphold universal values and promote human dignity. Okay, underneath that, promote good governance and defend strong, accountable and resilient democracies to deliver for their citizens. I think back at the time I was in Southeast Asia and, and Timor-Leste or, or East Timor, um, 
within a, less than a decade after, after their independence. Um, one of the things that they wanted to do, despite their sort of affiliation with, uh, with Portugal and their legal system, was to create an office of, the, of, of a public defense um, or public defender, um, you know, what they'd seen in Australia and the United States, but with no sort of institutional memory of that. And so it turns out we have a we have Department of Justice uh, legal advisor who sat at the embassy, who's naturally a subject matter expert in 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 many legal uh, legal affairs. So we have a you know we design a project and so forth, and we find that working together, you know, as we're going over the Ministry of Justice, becomes a great one-two punch. But the point I want to make here is that they saw the visual peer-to-peer -peer work between ourselves and with them as being this sort of defining image to how they were able to establish this office that really made no sense to 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 them and 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 what they had uh, what they had developed prior to the Indonesian occupation so I'll stop there great thank you very much I, I mean that that's a an, an excellent response as to how these strategic priorities filter down through the agency and and what you know USAID brings to the table and how that affects our partners around the globe uh, so thank you for that overview and, and we will get into a little more uh, depth here as we move forward. So when it comes to the competition for what comes next, you know, this was a major header uh, uh, section within the uh, national security strategy. And uh, what the president laid out was that uh, uh, we, the United States, face two strategic challenges. Uh, the first is that the post-Cold War era is definitely over and a competition is underway between the major powers to shape what comes next. And secondly, while this competition is underway, people all over the world are struggling to cope with the effects of shared challenges at cross borders uh, that include you know, climate change, food insecurity, uh, communicable diseases, terrorism, et cetera. So in competition for what comes next, rather than a world either at peace or at war, the competition continuum describes a world of enduring competition conducted through a mixture of cooperation, competition below armed conflict and armed conflict. DOD activities include broad strategic goals of assuring partners in cooperation, deterring adversaries in competition below armed conflict, coercing an adversary when competition moves toward conflict, and compelling the adversary in conflict or enemy during war. So the question being in this era of strategic competition, how is your organization working to meet today's challenges and those in the future to protect the security of the American people, expand economic prosperity and opportunity, and defend the democratic values at the heart of the American way of life? And uh, John, I'd like to ask you um, to kick us off on this one, please. All right. So our, at the State Department, our main tool um, for advancing these challenges is uh, diplomacy, as it's always been. Um, you know, you have a hammer, you have a range of things you can do with a hammer, you have a carrier battle group, you've got a range of things you can do with a carrier battle group. Uh, an embassy brings a similar range of options to the table. Um, when we talk about diplomacy, the, the, the smartest guy I ever tried to describe it was, I think it was Charles Freeman, who said it, it's about three A's, agency, advocacy, and analysis. Uh, that's that's what diplomacy brings to the table. Agency being that we are the U.S. government's representative abroad. If a foreign individual who wants a visa or a foreign government who wants to buy F-35s or a foreign government who uh, wants our vote on a U.N. resolution, uh, if they want to talk to the United States, they come to us. And obviously, there are lots of countries who want lots of things in the United States, so that there's usually a decent number of people showing up at our door on a given day. Advocacy is we try to persuade other countries and populations to do what we think is in the best interest of the United States, which ideally will also be in their best interest. Um, and we do that through offers of development assistance. We do that through sometimes the threat of military force. Uh, we do that sometimes just through sunny disposition and um, really hard negotiating, which has remarkably more power than you might expect. And then lastly, there's analysis. It's what we provide back to Washington and to policymakers. It's, this is what's happening in this country. This is how people are feeling. This is how they're likely to respond to this initiative you have. Um, this is how you can modify your initiative to make it 
more likely to be popular here. Um, that kind of triad of A is, is sort of what we bring, and we bring it to all of these challenges for defending democratic values to expanding economic prosperity, and whether we're, we bring those value, we bring those capabilities, whether we're trying to um, you know, marginalize a great power rival or whether we're trying to uh, cooperate with and incorporate that rival into some kind of uh, global structure that is not going to work effectively without them. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, there's a lot of um, a lot of pieces to this particular question, and and I think in um, uh, across the board, um, you know, a lot of uh, government agencies are out there, uh, you know, assuring partners in, in cooperation as we as we move forward. Um, uh, somewhat, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, coercing um, an, an environment uh, to dissuade support toward, uh, uh, you know, adversarial control, etc. Uh, would any of the other panel members like to offer a, a comment on, on this particular area? Happy to. Oh, oh, please go ahead, Peter. Well, you know, when it comes to, to competition, uh, uh, there's some Einstein, if I had 60 minutes to apply to, uh, you know, to, uh, to an issue, I'd spend 50, 55 minutes thinking about, the, thinking about the issue and five minutes on the solution. I don't have 60 minutes, I'm no Einstein, but I do think competition, you know, at first glance versus how I think we're really applying it is worth sort of mentioning, you know, we're on the heels of the national, uh, national championship for, for college football this week, right, and, you know, the, the things we think about in that competition framework um, rules space time tactical implementation fitness right um, they all have they all have boundaries they're all finite you know when we think of pacing adversaries you know these con these constraints become far more unknown so much so that the unknowns are even unknown and yeah you know, and i think that's where we get into complexity science something i look at here at the university and almost everybody is sort of thumbing through pages about like, you know, so this use of complex with this, which can be an ambiguous term in and of itself, you know, what does that mean um, when we're talking about uh, great power competition or strategic competition? And, um, you know, I think in our case, as I'm going to, as I sort of referenced in the answer to the first question is more about the how than necessarily the what. And we have to be careful, I think, with the latter, because I think that can sometimes get us into a complicated situation where we we know more about uh, the variables than we actually do and so you know the how in this case i think goes right back to the end of that question the heart of the american way of life and again we we rush to certain images about that way of life but at the end of the day it's state and societies and systems of checks and balances and I think that that is what, you know, in the back of our minds at USAID, when we are overseas in these, in these contexts, that we are trying to emulate and strengthen, even by value add advice, you know, at, at, at times. And so, um, you know, I think that uh, right now we, we phrase this in terms of localization and progress beyond programs. Um, those are just two of, 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 of things that I capture from, from Washington, but, um, you know, they, they mean something and you're just to leverage a military adage by, with, and through, you know, for us, localization is by, with, and through local partners. And the more we can do that, the more we have the chance to really sustain that sort of system and checks and balances. Because it's not just the work that we do with governments. It's the work we do with civil societies. It's the work we do with the private sectors. Um, and I think that is higher ground that we underestimate at times. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And, and uh, I would like, I, I wasn't going to initially uh, ask Jenny this question, but, but I think it's important to tie in what that NGO community uh, does with our partners out there, maybe not with the goal of directly supporting the strategic objectives within the national security strategy, but just by the, the, the byproduct of their activities, how that does support it. Could, could you touch on that, Jenny? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, you know, I was thinking about the, the localization and locally led development angle when we get to talking about the expanding partner network, 
because I think everything that Peter said, I just fully uh, agree with. And I really like the way that he said, you know, it, it's higher ground than we realize, right? I think we saw with the, with the pandemic, um, when all of a sudden international staff left countries, right? Who was running the programs? It was local staff and it was local partners and they did just fine. <laughs> and I think, you know, there's a whole shift in the, in the development discourse and in the development sector right now about how to do locally led development better and how to not do, uh, you know, localization is sort of the shorthand, but it's not about creating minis around the world and just localizing what we do or what we want from Washington onto a place. It's really about putting partners, be that community-based organizations, local governments, private sector, putting those who are affected by these transnational challenges in the driver's seat of solving them. And the more that we do that, I mean, what we're going to get to China and the PRC in a little bit. The more we do that, I think that the stronger the model is and the case is for the American way of supporting development. Um, and it's also, it, it's just more effective and sustainable overall. And so that is something that I think, again, we've got really good alignment on what the NGO community, uh, the way that we're partnering, you know, we try to provide, um, and, and there's a lot of talk, like I said, it's, it's a sector-wide shift at the moment. And there's talks about how business models need to change to support uh, the, the shift then what really gets to expanding economic uh, prosperity and what is the role and how do you provide the sort of backstop and support without necessarily being in the lead. Um, so that's a whole different tangent than you probably wanted to go down, but that's one thing that comes to mind with how partners are, are adapting. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And because I think that's a very important perspective, especially when we're looking at that commercial aspect of the acronym we use, uh, GIMC, Joint Interagency Intergovernmental Multinational Commercial. Uh, and, and you definitely fall into that piece. And we have to consider that uh, as we look into the future. So thank you very much for that input. Okay, so I'm cooperating to address shared challenges in an era of competition. And this kind of goes along with what we just talked about. And the national security strategy, you know, started with, you know, heightened competition uh, between democracies and autocracies is just one of two critical trends that we face. The other is shared challenge, or what some call transnational challenges that do not respect borders, but do affect all nations. From a DOD perspective, you know, military operations in support of competition take the form of information activities, cyberspace operations, special operations, support to law enforcement, counter threat finance, threat to finance intelligence, uh, networks engagement and large scale exercises, activities and operations that demonstrate a capability or will to act when provoked. Current competition requires special operations forces to implement an adaptive and agile capability. While both the United States and the adversary are constantly assessing, evaluating and modifying their competition activities and strategies. So in regard to this question, you know, what is your organization doing regarding transnational challenges? Those that do not respect borders and which affect all nations, as was the case with the People's Republic of China's unwillingness to cooperate with the international community in the early phases of the COVID pandemic, as an example. And if I could start with John, please. From the State Department perspective, as it is right in the title, we take a statist view of the world. The world has sovereign countries and sovereign countries are pretty much what get most things done. Even most mass civil society movements out there, you know, most, most of your big and important international organizations are comprised of sovereign states. Uh, most of your large mass civil society movements are working to persuade certain sovereign states to change their behavior. So while state tries to keep its doors open and talk to as many people as we can, and Jenny's going to eye roll a bit at that, I'm guessing, um, at the end of the day, we're going to try to do most of, work, most of our work through states or organized bodies of states like NATO, the United Nations, the European Union, et cetera. Um, when it comes to transnational challenges, 
you know, we use, we use the, we tend to go for the fora that seems most likely uh, that can sometimes be an existing one, or sometimes you make up a new one off the, off the cuff, like uh, the recent, you know, AUKUS, uh, what's that, Australia, UK, and United States to, to build submarines for Australia. The example yeah. you're raising here with COVID is, is an interesting one because uh, it, you've got two, I would argue you've got two different problems there in parallel. And one of those problems is a problem state has experience in, which is trying to coordinate pandemic responses. I once worked for a guy who was the coordinator of state's response to um, the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Those processes were put into play when COVID-19 happened. Uh, it's just that COVID-19 was so much more virulent than the previous diseases that it simply outpaced um, the ability of international coordination mechanisms to really keep up. Um, and I'm not, I, I am not enough of an expert in either immunology or uh, disease diplomacy to, to be able to say if there's things that could have been done differently about that. It certainly didn't help anyone that the Chinese government definitely did not share everything it knew about what was happening with COVID in its own country. Um, they were laid off that. Um, they, they say recalcitrant about it for some time. I, I'm not enough of an immunology expert to know how much that really made a difference, but it definitely had an impact. But that's a bilateral problem. Um, and it's a bilateral problem that 180 different countries were all thinking, yeah, we've got the same bilateral problem. You would have had a line of you know, well-masked ambassadors socially distanced in front of the Chinese health ministry, each waiting to come in and say, hey, what the hell are you people doing? There's an extent to which the United States can coordinate those kinds of actions, but they really work best when they're um, spontaneous. And COVID was a serious enough problem that um, we didn't have to do a lot of encouraging to other people of like, hey, you also should push the Chinese to be more forthcoming. Everyone wanted to push them to do that on their own. Um, how much impact that actually had on Chinese decision making in the end is, a, I guess, a different question. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you for that response. Um, and, and keep in mind, panelists, you know, COVID was thrown up here as an example, but any other area that you think is a transnational issue is what, we, what we're talking about here. And I, I believe, Jenny, that, that you want to respond to this one as well. Yeah, I would. I would like to bring up maybe a couple of different examples um, uh, on transnational challenges and the way that we're working on them right now. One is climate, which also featured very heavily throughout the national security strategy. Um, and one thing that, that we're doing at Interaction is a couple of years ago, and you know, recognize we were already late to the game on this, but a lot of uh, international NGOs and those focused on development are, they don't see themselves, they're not environmental NGOs. They don't see themselves as climate NGOs. That's not their mission, right? But one thing that, that we're trying to do across uh, the US-based NGO sector uh, focusing on these global challenges is engage them in a conversation around actually climate change is coming for us all and the impacts are coming. They are going to impact your ability to carry out your program. They are going to impact your ability, like the type of programs that you are able to do, the needs that you are going to see, where we are going to see these needs. And, and therefore we really need to be tackling this much more heads on. And so what, what we did at Interaction is we created a CEO signed sort of climate compact, which we have about a hundred uh, NGOs on at the moment that had a set of commitments about how they were gonna look at their own organization, both from sustainability uh, levels to also how they incorporate uh, climate impacts into their work and mainstreaming and thinking about adaptation and thinking about resilience. Um, you know, I really think that that is the, the, the kind of the name of the game uh, going forward. USAID just put out their resilience, new resilience uh, strategy or policy, um, just had a conversation about that yesterday. And I think, again, that this recognition of where climate change fits in and affects everyone is, is something that we're looking at very seriously. Another area that we're looking at, again, as everybody is, is the food security crisis. You know, I think we all know that the current levels of humanitarian uh, crises and funding are unsustainable. There's been a great amount uh, of funding through supplemental funds in the last couple of years. That has been urgently needed. It is very well received and appreciated. We've got to get out of this cycle of shocks. 
Um, and that means there needs to be more investment in prevention. We got we have plenty of data. To John's point earlier about analysis and how analysis uh, is, is really important, absolutely. When it comes to food security and where you're going to see uh, huge amounts of, of malnutrition, food insecurity, and possible famine, we have that data. What we don't have is early action. Um, and so what we're doing, again, across the NGO sector is trying to take a bigger look at the instruments of food security response. Uh, look, again, from the development to the humanitarian and early response uh, spectrum and say, you know, okay, what needs to change? What is just baked into the system that can't change? And what maybe do we think can't change but needs to? And trying to lay out so, some thinking for the next you know, five to 10 years, because if we don't get out of these shocks, then we are just going to continually be relying on a humanitarian infrastructure that is already creaked. And you've got, you know, partners stepping back globally. You, you see Europe, you see the big donors, uh, the well is drying up. So something has to change. And so those are some of the areas that, that we're thinking about at Interaction. Thank you very much for that. And I didn't know, Peter, I, I saw that you had a, a grin in your, your face there. Did that mean you wanted to interject, sir? Always chomping at the bit. I just have to <laughs> constantly look at the clock and make sure I'm, I'm cognizant of the, of the time constraint. I mean, you know, and I, yeah, I'm chomping at the bit because of the transnational challenge and you think of early phase of COVID pandemic. I mean, what are the first, uh, you know, what's the first guidance we get from CDC safe distancing, right? Out of sight, out of mind. Well, guess what's the most out of sight? It's out of sight. For most of, for most nations in the global south, um, the ocean, the economic exclusive zone, right? And what's going on out there? Transnational challenge: illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing conducted by distant water fleets. Who's the biggest perpetrator? The People's Republic of China. Um, you know, and so you know, and yet we don't have the face-to-face -face interactions that we that we normally have to to add to that. So you know, how do we weigh in on things like that? As USAID gets pulled into the discussion on, on how to counter that, um, you know, I, there, there's this institutional sort of resistance at, 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 at certain points to say, hey, you know, we're in the sustainable fishing business, so to speak. Um, you know, that's what we've been working on for decades. We don't want to get pulled into this competition um, uh, initiative at first. But then what we re recognize is, all of that programming on the ground actually adds quite a bit of value when we are trying to appreciate the context in which this, these things are taking place. And so, you know, we can actually contribute to a transnational challenge without actually having to have programming uh, on the ground doing something about it. And I think, you know, this comes back to the complexity stuff, you know, David Snowden and others talk about the evolutionary principle of acceptation, right? You know, you've got body parts that, that, are, that were, that have been fitted for generations to do certain things, but you can actually use them for other for other things as well. Um, and that's where innovation comes from. So there's ways that we can that that we can think about that acceptation of, of things that we're good at and apply them in other domains. And guess what? That doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to do that. So stop there. Thank you very much for that. Yes, Dallas, please. Yeah, I just wanted to add again, reinforcing that I'm coming at this from a very niche perspective. But you know, when we think about nuclear terrorism, uh, the transnational aspect of this is really important to us, um, and not only because it requires, uh, you know, a lot of international cooperation to prevent, but the the ramifications of an act of nuclear terrorism, I think, are are kind of counterintuitive in the sense of of the the kind of global scope of it. And what I mean by that is. Um, you know, we tend to think that the the likely targets of an act of nuclear terrorism would be, you know, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, you know, first world countries uh, that are in the crosshairs of transnational terrorists. But it really would have the effects of an attack would would have really uh, global ramifications. There's a there's a quote from uh, Kofi Annan uh, that I really like, the former um, general secretary of the UN, where he he, he says. Were such an attack to occur, it would not only cause widespread death and destruction, but would stagger the world economy and thrust tens of millions of people into dire poverty. Given what we know about the relationship between poverty and infant mortality, uh, and any nuclear terrorist attack would have a second death toll throughout the developing world. So, you know, 
when we try to galvanize kind of global cooperation uh, behind this this effort, it's easy to imagine a you know Bolivia or Burkina Faso saying, "Hey, not my problem," you know. But so we we really have this this uh, imperative to impress upon every nation on earth, you know, that this really is truly a global problem. Um, when the Obama administration stood up the nuclear security summits back in 2010, you had the largest gathering of heads of state um, since the founding of the United Nations in you know what 1946 or whatever. Uh, and so I think that really was reflective of the the truly global scope of this challenge and and kind of continually reinforcing its transnational nature is is a very high priority of of my organization. Over. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for that. I, and it's it's extremely important. Uh, obviously, not just the security of the United States, but but to our partners out there as well uh, from that regional perspective. You know, transnational challenges are are just very difficult to manage, but we have to continue working towards it. Okay, using diplomacy to build the strongest possible coalitions. Um, you know, national security strategy. Uh, you know, President Biden's goal is um, you know to build upon the network, uh, assemble the strongest uh, possible coalitions uh, that advance and defend a free and open world. Um, and he goes on to state that you know that includes uh, democracies, those nations out there with shared uh, democratic values, and those that are willing to change. So that's that's a strategic view on this. Uh, so with the goal of building those strongest possible coalitions uh, to protect uh, and advance our interests around the world, the Department of Defense implements a variety of security assistance and security cooperation activities with partner nations. Uh, US SOCOM conducts partner nation training events in support of these DOD efforts to improve partner nations internal security and enhance US national security interests. So in terms of uh, uh, in terms of this question, you know, how do you see your organization building upon your existing partner networks? And uh, uh, Peter, we could start with you, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Well, I, I mean, I already talked about this some to some extent with uh, with the agency priority for localization. I mean, the idea is that the more by, with, and through we can do with local partners wherever they exist in that state societal uh, network, the better. Um, but I feel what I want to do actually with this question is actually go occur to your neck of the woods, which is the the GMC, uh, the GMC uh, parameter. The reason I say that is because uh, a Chinese scholar, um, some writing of his that was circulated in December, and this one point that he mentions was a US, a, a, the U.S. advantage was really in this partner and ally space. Um, and it's a pretty objective document, actually. Obviously, it's written for Beijing, but he talks about the fact that um, you know our ability to convene and leverage is is in this advantage. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I even think that Jim C could even be plus, and that is combining that sort of localization um, idea with the joint interagency, intergovernmental, multinational, and commercial sort of partners. Um, that are involved in a place like the Pacific Islands or you know West Africa or you know these these uh, these emerging um, geoeconomic uh, areas of interest um, and that plus meaning that the actual the the stakeholders in those domains themselves being being prominent in how we talk about um, in a peer to peer way um, how to go about these root causes and uh, and and address them through Western rules-based order systems. So um, I'll stop there. Absolutely, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, Jen, I believe you had a response for this as well. Yeah, just briefly, um, because I think you know we've already talked uh, to the localization, locally led development components a little bit, but I really think that that is an area where our members and when we are ourselves are looking to develop more more partnerships. I think another interesting area to watch is the growth of uh, networks from the Global South uh, and, and the leadership role that they are continuing to play. There's the NEAR network, there's a DESO, there's a number of different organizations um, that are, are coming forward to say, well, you know, wait, it doesn't need to be by the, perhaps the international rules-based order, yes but does it have to be by exactly those rules and we should have a, a greater voice and a greater seat at the table? 
And I think, um, you know, we're building ties with those organizations and trying to, to learn from them and making sure that the way we're trying to partner matches what, in fact, they need. Because, again, that I think that the convening power that, that Peter spoke to, I think, is really um, important. Um, but convening to do what? And I, I think listening and uh, adapting our model um, to be supportive is, is really important in this case. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, Peter, was that you agreeing or did you have a comment, sir? Oh, very much. No, I just I, I wanted to I wanted to respond to Jenny just to, to provide an example. I mean, I think that you know a lot of times we can talk about these things conceptually and without an example, it makes it hard to really usher home. But you know, in, in talking about uh, Gym C Plus, you know, I think back to an experience in in uh, Timor Leste. Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, you know, a, a great program to help Timor sort of strengthen its control against corruption. Part of that piece was at the Timorese request was to help it establish an audit court or tribunal de contes. Now, we don't have an audit court in, in the United States system. And so that was a bit of a head scratcher, although, you know, we put forward, you know, the the program description, the terms of reference, the scope of work, that sort of thing in, in, in the RFP that we put forward. But then when, you know, it gets down to implementing, we're like, Hmm. I mean, we got we got some we got some thinking to do here. Well, lo and behold, you know, we actually start talking to Portugal. You know, the 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 father or, or whatever of 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 that of the thought process of having that audit court in place, and so we end up getting into a partnership where they really take over that uh, the the core responsibilities of of what was put forward in that MCC program. But meanwhile, what we do is we don't let that level of effort die. What we do is is we were working with the Ministry of Finance and the executive branch on internal audits, which we know a lot about. And so what we were able to do with the Portuguese is like, well, wait a minute, let's do Let's figure out at this early stage in Timor's development, how can we cross fertilize a lot of the work that we're doing on both the internal and the external audit stuff so that they begin, they begin to sort of, well, I shouldn't say begin, but you know, that they are, they, they are able to better speak their own language about this in terms that work on sort of both sides of that internal and external audit Um Capacity. And so, again, it's the kind of thing where, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the prime minister himself at the time is attending some of this stuff and speaking to this. And I think when we talk about influence, you know, these are little things that that mean a lot because I think they see that that um, that they see that system of checks and balances really usher through what what we're what we're trying to achieve. So um, stop there. Just one, again, wanted to throw out an example. Thank you very much. And, and I, I really think that did help to illuminate the, this particular topic. So, hey, we're going to shift gears now and move into uh, global priorities, which is the next major heading uh, in the national security uh, uh, strategy. So he starts out with China. So we'll talk about the People's Republic of, uh, of China. Uh, the most comprehensive and serious challenge to U.S. national security is the PRC's coercive and increasingly aggressive endeavor to refashion the Indo-Pacific region and the international system to suit its own interests and authoritarian preferences. Excuse me. The Department of Defense will reinforce and build out a resilient security architecture in the Indo-Pacific region to sustain a free and open regional order and deter attempts to resolve disputes by force. Uh, and that coming from Secretary Austin. Uh, so question being, what is your organization doing or can it do to strengthen our allies and partners resilience against the PRC efforts to influence regional relationships, e economies, technologies, et cetera. Um, and uh, John, if I could start with you, sir. Yeah, I worry I'm coming off as a little too boring here by just saying the same thing about practicing diplomacy again and again, which is an inherently boring activity. But I'm going to I'm going to pivot on uh, that boredom and actually make a case here for more boredom. And what I mean by that is um, there's a lot we can do to strengthen partners' resilience against the PRC and the, the things it's trying to accomplish abroad. But I think if you look back over the last year, there's nothing we've done in that space, and this isn't a criticism of, of anything the US government's done, 
Um, there's nothing we've done in that space that has been more effective than what the Chinese government has done to itself in terms of damaging its own credibility. Um, their wolf warrior diplomacy has not gone well for them. They are not necessarily, I, I would make an argument that they're not actually gaining as much influence as we like to worry that they do. Um, that sometimes the, the, the measures they take that look you know, really strong and aggressive, and I think sometimes we're a little bit jealous and we kind of wish we could kind of break the rules, um, but we can't because we, we built the rules-based order and so that means we have to follow them and that's frustrating. You know, I think sometimes we all want to be Batman, right? We all want to be the vigilante who gets to do cool stuff. But in fact, sometimes just sitting back and letting your opponent screw up actually uh, works really well. I think Napoleon even said something about like never interfere with your enemy when he's in the process of making a mistake. Before you, before we jump into how we um, strengthen our allies and partners against the Chinese, it's often a very smart idea to ask ourselves like, do we need to? Or will they figure this out for themselves? And I worry that sometimes we don't put enough reflection in, in those kinds of questions of, I think what the British used to call masterly inactivity. Thanks. Excellent, John. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I believe, uh, Peter, you wanted to respond to this one as well, sir? Yeah, uh, it, it, John's a tough act to follow, so I'll, I'll, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. But, you know, I, you know, I'd start off with, uh, you know, water always finding, you know, the deepest parts where it can manifest. You know, if you don't manage it, it will rise and create flooding, um, you know, if you don't do something about it. Peter Senge, you know, the, the, the brilliant sort of systems thinker, I was talking, I heard him talking about uh, climate change. And uh, one point that he made really resonated with me, which I think is relevant here when we're talking about resilience. And he said, you know, if these thousands and thousands of communities around the world, if they can't, if, if they can't understand climate change in a way that makes sense to them and leads to things that they can do about it, in their own view, it's not going to work. I mean, we, you know, we 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 can't sort of manifest it all from from you know uh, with as an armchair quarterback. Um, no, so transition that to I think you know, uh, you know Beijing's approach with Belt and Road, and it's you know, deliberately non-interventional, right? I mean, they're taking sort of the the Coach K approach, I would think, using college basketball, using all the college basketball legend, you know, he didn't necessarily innovate anything. What he did was he saw what others did and he perfected it. And so, you know, I think so much of what Belt and Road um, does is actually leveraging off the history, both good and bad, of, of what development um, actors have done in, in generations in the past. But the fact that they aren't engaging with local populations they're doing that deliberately to say, hey, look, what happens in your sovereign domains? That's your business. I mean, look at what they're doing. Look at how they're intervening. Well, I mean, and granted, that isn't a perfect story, but getting to the local populations is higher ground. We can do better at it, sure. But this is an area in competition where they have chosen not to engage. And so, you know, when we talk about resilience in certain places, certainly look at the Pacific Islands, look at a lot of places where this is a front and center issue, um, you know, and being able to look across the table and be able to share wisdom, wisdom rules in a lot of these settings, you know, that is, like I said, higher ground. So stop there. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. So as far as cooperating on shared challenges, um, you know, the, it's the view within the national security strategy uh, that in order to tackle these shared challenges, uh, it requires global involvement um, in which we will fully engage all countries and institutions to cooperate on shared threats, uh, while at the same time, double down on our efforts uh, to, uh, to strengthen cooperation with like-minded partners. So I think we can all agree that that's not a bad thing to do. From your organization's perspective, uh, you know what challenges has your organization faced with uh, faced that required working with others in a cooperative manner? Um, you know, maybe related to transnational criminal organizations, terrorism, uh, et cetera. And uh, Peter, I know I've got you down here for for a response. I'd love to hear it, sir. 
I mean, for, for starters, it's a great book that just was recently published called The Enduring Struggle by John Norris. It just talks about USAID's history just since, you know, the early 60s and, and the Kennedy administration when it, when, it, when it was established and what it has gone through and how it has evolved with, uh, you know, the oversight mechanisms over it and how that alone has been an enduring struggle. But it, it does sort of... Um, it does, I think, create an image that uh, I think many of us have had to sort of uh, uh, had had to in, endure, and that is the fact that you know, White House directives, congressional directions, and, and so forth trans, transition to to budget lines. You know, we develop programs. These are years long processes that, that take place, and this is like the nuts and bolts of what a lot of us do. So and then it comes to statecraft and it comes to sitting around the table and think about what well, emerging issues, competition, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, something that effect. I mean, we're all already doing what we're doing. There's not a, a genuine white, white board per se. It's hard to make those shifts because they take years to do, um, you know, um, and so it's, you know, time that often um, that often can be the biggest constraint because of how long these things take just within our departments and agencies. But let me give an example. President's emergency plan for AIDS relief. I mean, a, a, a giant investment made in the early 2000s, um, you know, to really make a dent, either go bigger or stay on the porch, however the saying goes, so we decided to go big. The U.S. government did um, huge budgets, uh, multi-billion dollar budgets each year. But fairly stagnant progress for a while until I think PEPFAR and the interagency underneath it understood that we needed to take more of a passenger seat um, perspective to how it was to how it was uh, being undertaken. Less doctor patient, more sort of open ears and, and listening. Then they put in what I like to label as a complexity sort of application where you know every year, one week a year, subject matter experts, not just from the USG, but subject matter experts from the countries themselves, as well as civil society representatives, come and hash out the data and really talk about what shifts and tweaks need to be made. And that's done quarterly. Um, and so, voila, you know, a place like, uh, you know, I don't want to pick out anybody in particular, but places that were deemed just 10 years ago as being hopeless or, um, you know, unable to really make a dent are on the verge of epidemic control now. I think largely because of the way that PEPFAR has actually shifted and applied sort of a complexity dynamic to it. So, um, <laughs> that's a that's a challenge and, and an attempt at a, at a at a response to that challenge. Over. Excellent. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Now, a couple subcategories within this area. You know, we we it, it involves you know climate um, and energy security, um, pandemics and bio defense, uh, food insecurity, and we've touched on some of these already. Um, but it's going to go also into arms control, nonproliferation, and terrorism, and we'll, we're going to address those here in just a moment. Um, but are there any other challenges that, that, you know, that people out there have, have faced when we're talking about, um, you know, the, you know, dealing with a shared challenge? And, and I did want to ask Jenny on this one, when we talk about, uh, you know, those non-government organizations that are out there, you know, trying to do those, those, those good, you know, and, and those, those needed things for, for those populations. Do you, do you see challenges conducting those activities either with the partner nation or uh, are there perceived uh, uh, drawbacks to doing so from for a U.S. government perspective? No, it's a great challenge, and, and of course, the partner nation always has has a vote right in the in the activities, and uh, there, there's always a lot of negotiations that go on at every level, right, with with the central government in most cases, but also local governments, and so I think. Uh, and then, of course, NGOs are also often negotiating and, and engaging with a bunch of different donors and uh, partner countries at the same time, right? And so one thing that that happens a lot is you'll have NGO forums, you know, within a country where different NGOs come together, and it is sort of a place to try to help foster that coordination, and that, that proves to be fairly effective in a lot of cases. I also did just want to note an example, and it touches back actually a little bit on the the, the PRC and the Belt and Road piece, but something that can undermine our ability to work on these challenges. We have to be careful in this era of, of competition and in wanting to make sure 
that we maintain the end, that we don't accidentally undermine our investments. And the example I will give here is a small provision that was in the 2019 NDAA, uh, Section 889, which was about the U.S. government not contracting to procure Chinese telecoms. Okay, fine. On its face, great. The problem is it also prevented contracts with entities that use any prohibited technologies. The spirit of it is great. The impl implementation was very problematic because by USAID's own you know, tally, almost 70% of their own missions in Sub-Saharan Africa used some form of, of prohibited technology because they were counting internet services, right? Um, and so that's just a, a small example of as we're trying to negotiate and cooperate and, and ha face these challenges, we need to make sure that we don't do things that on the surface sound good, have a good goal, but actually cast a big wide net that might be unintended and actually um, undermine our ability to operate in the world. Excellent. Thank you very much for that since I put you on the spot. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, so we wanted to get to this uh, arms control and non-proliferation. Uh, nuclear, chemical, biological weapons proliferation is vitally important and enduring global challenge, as we've already heard uh, Dallas mention. Uh, requires sustained collaboration to prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction and material, their means of delivery and technology. So the United States will continue to work with our partners, allies, civil society, uh, international organizations to strengthen arms control and non-proliferation uh, systems. So, you know, one aspect of DOD's uh, nuclear posture review, which was published with the National Defense Strategy, uh, suggests that extended nuclear deterrence contributes to U.S. non-proliferation goals by giving allies and partners confidence that they can resist strategic threats and remain secure without acquiring nuclear weapons of their own. Part of the DOD's assurance to allies and partners is a continued and strengthened commitment to arms control, nuclear nonproliferation, and nuclear risk reduction to improve collective security by reducing or constraining adversary capabilities. So uh, I'm just gonna go straight to Dallas on this one. Uh, you know, how are we engaging our allies and partners, civil society, et cetera, to prevent the spread of WMD? Uh, obviously, in, in as much generic and you know, classified uh, forum as we can. Sure. So, you know, recognizing that there are a lot of different categories and subcategories within that are kind of baked into this question, you've got state government actors, you have non-state actors, you have chem, bio, nuclear, which are all, you know, discrete. Uh, you have both the weapons and the precursor materials, and then you have their delivery means, all of which kind of encompass different disciplines. Uh, so I'd just kind of limit my my discussion to the nuclear element of that and specifically the, you know, the state portion. Um, you know, I really think we're at a, at a critical moment um, globally where the proliferation of weapons, you know, state weapons are concerned in the sense that, you know, leading up to Ukraine, there had been a lot of uh, concern that about waning U.S. security commitments. And as you note, the, the whole notion of extended deterrence is to is to keep other you know allies and partners under the umbrella of of the U.S. nuclear stockpile, nuclear deterrent, so that they don't have an incentive to develop uh, indigenous weapons of their own. And, and I think there had been some kind of gnawing concern in East Asia, in the Middle East, et cetera that maybe U.S. security guarantees weren't as reliable as they once were. I'm hopeful uh, that after, you know, the U.S.-led uh, response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that they will see the United States as a reliable partner, um, and that would kind of fortify their, uh, their, their implicit trust in us. However, I think there are some, you know, issues associated with Ukraine and, and others that preexisted the conflict that are cause for concern. One, you know, in Ukraine, we've seen that the the direct U.S. or NATO involvement in the conflict has been absolutely unfathomable from the start, precisely because of uh, Russia's um, possession of nuclear weapons. And so, that to me is a is a pretty effective advertisement for the utility of nuclear weapons as a deterrent. And so, I would worry that a lot of countries on Earth would think like, "Hey, we got to get one of these." They, you know, they seem to be really effective. 
Um, and then there are other kind of issues that have been you know, building for a long time. One of them is the the kind of weakening of the of the global non-proliferation regime, the, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. The whole premise of that treaty was a, a, a social compact between the five recognized nuclear powers and you know the non-nuclear weapon states that you know the 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 the, the latter would would not develop nuclear weapons um, in exchange for you know nuclear technology and assistance. And then the recognized nuclear powers would eventually, over time, undertake negotiations in good faith to, you know, relinquish their nuclear weapons. All five of the recognized powers, the US, UK, France, Russia, China, are actively and aggressively modernizing either their nuclear weapons or their delivery means or both. And, and there is a kind of a, a groundswell of resentment among the nuclear have-nots have that that this is a fiction that that they're never gonna they're never gonna give up their nuclear weapons. The whole thing is a sham. Um, we've we've seen lately you know, within the last few years, you know the the treaty on the Pro prohibition of nuclear weapons, the Ban Treaty, which enjoyed the support of you know 122 nations when it was voted on in the United Nations. And so I worry that there it's going to kind of undermine the credibility of the NPT as this kind of mechanism to ensure the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. It's not going to do anything to cause those five countries to disarm and relinquish their nuclear weapons, but it could undercut the, the kind of prestige and effectiveness of the NPT. And, and then what? You know, the world is then a free-for-all where any country with the technical means to do so can develop a nuclear weapon. Um, you know, we're seeing even among U.S. allies, indications of interest in nuclear weapons. Just yesterday, uh, the president of South Korea, you know, very explicitly stated that it was, you know, a potential policy option for uh, the South Korean government to develop an indigenous nuclear weapon. That's very concerning, um, you know, that that even in the context of, you know, persistent U.S. assurance of, of its of the goodness and um, consistency of its security, guarantees that they're still talking about, you know, indi an indigenous weapon. So I'm rambling, but the, we're really at a critical moment um, globally to kind of refocus um, attention on non-proliferation and, and ensure that we don't see this cascade of, of nuclear weapons. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Dallas. You know, this, this is a, a very important uh, topic, obviously, and it's going to remain in our in the forefront uh, I'm, I'm very glad to have people like you working in the background so I don't have to worry about it and I can go to sleep tonight. Um, we do have some questions uh, from the audience out there. So at this time, we'll just hold, this, uh, hold on the question slide. We'll just keep that thing right there for the moment. Thank you, Dr. Burrell. What I'd like to do is take a look at some of these. And so the first question, um, Many times, special operations are operating in the same overseas spaces as other government agencies to address human security needs. How can special operations and USAID or NGOs better partner in fragile states to accomplish a common purpose? How can we make this collaboration habitual? Uh, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and throw out a, an initial comment on that. Um, Yes, we do often, you know, operate, special operations forces do often operate in, in, in the same areas with many other government agencies uh, in conducting, you know, their, their particular activities. Now, of course, all of that stuff is coordinated, um, uh, deconflicted where, where needed, um, right there at, at the country team level at the U.S. Embassy. Um, you know, special operations uh, forces will not do anything in a partner nation that the U.S. ambassador has not approved. So it's not like they're out there doing things that the State Department is unaware of or the ambassador is unaware of. Um, and much of that uh, is coordinated uh, and in support of the integrated country strategy as well that the, uh, uh, that the country team, the ambassador, uh, develops. Uh, so I'll just leave that part of that. Uh, Peter, I think you were, I'm sorry, John. John. Yeah, uh, whoever asked that question is right in my bread and butter. Um, most of my work at, at CSO is is on signal questions, and most of my client base there is is different people associated with the SF or CA or PSYOP communities. Um, 
I would, I would just say, you know, you, you, you're going out to a country with a certain mission and it's probably fairly uh, well-defined um, and clear, but it's very possible you're going to end up someplace where you're the sole representative of the United States government. So when I spoke earlier about, you know, agency advocacy and analysis, when, when you pass through an embassy, um, don't, don't just make courtesy calls and don't let embassy personnel um, just give you courtesy calls. Um, figure out what the United States is trying to get or really cares about in this country. And if there's any way you can facilitate that from the particular mission set you've got, um, spitball how you can do that. Think about, you know, if people come to you with questions, they're definitely outside your wheelhouse because you're the only American they've seen. Um, do you know, did you meet that person back at the embassy who can answer that question if you don't know the answer to it? Um, and then lastly, like, what are the things that the embassy in Washington would want to know about this place that may not strictly be in the realm of military information, but hey, you're there, you're, you're in that market, or you drove down that road. And so you need to know what those um, information requirements are and be able to pass those up. And then the last thing I would put to you is, if you're, a, if you're going out with a four person team or a 12 person team, Think about being a five person team or a 13 person team. Be ready to ask an embassy person along to join you for some portion of whatever it is you're doing. Uh, I think you'll find that they will benefit a lot from getting outside their day-to-day -day activities and getting into parts of the country with parts of the people they don't ordinarily see. I think you'll find you'll benefit a lot. They, they just bring you a different set of, um, insights and experiences that might prove to be a force multiplier for your group as well. All right. Thank you very much, sir. And I, I do want to ask, because uh, it's a unique perspective as far as the NGOs. Uh, so, Jenny, could you give us just a, a, a brief what you think from the NGO perspective as far as this type of relationship? No, it's a, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a complex one, I will say. You know, briefly, and I think I think we all already know this, there are humanitarian principles associated with the provision of humanitarian aid. And so one thing that does not foster relationships is calling any of the any missions of that type humanitarian missions, right? The more because and, and, and the more they use that terminology, the more it actually just complicates the ability to engage uh, with NGOs because there are real concerns about neutrality and partiality humanity and ability to provide that aid. Um, as I mentioned before, there are in a lot of places, there are these NGO forums. They are particularly in a lot of places where you do have a uh, fragile uh, or, or conflict environment, and that can be a good place to potentially engage. Agree, there's a whole lot of alignment and overlap on the end states that, that we all wanna see. I think the question here is how do we best define the lanes? Right, so that it is clear, and so that it is really clear to those uh, populations that we are interacting with where the boundaries are. Excellent, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, yes, Peter, go ahead, sir. I don't know how the mic too much, I know we're running low on time, but I mean, two excellent answers. So my yes and to an attempt to, to follow up to both of them is, you know, the question, you know, again, I try and get right to uh, right to the examples and what inhibits them. Um, you know, talk about uh, partnerships between SOF and USA that actually exist, you know, so how do you replicate them? The answer I get back a lot in the classroom is authorities and permissions on the military side. And on the USAID side, it gets back to this multi-year sort of design process and that, you know, these are years or even decades in the making. We can't just like, you know, shift the, the, the compass direction on the fly. So then the question is, you know, these ad hoc examples, many of which I referenced already earlier, you know, how do we make them less ad hoc? You know, and on the front end, where is the, where is the, 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 the policy? Where is the doctrine? Where is the incentive? to actually enable people to pursue what, what Jenny and John were, were, were talking about. And you know, these more integrated teams, but it incentivize that. And then on the backside, you know, how do you actually develop a, you know, a clearinghouse of, those, of these, these ad hoc things so that we can use them for influence and they don't get 
as the Raiders of the Lost, Lost Ark movie ends, you know, putting the Lost Ark in some archived storage facility with 10,000 other, uh, other things, you know, what a great message that sent. That was what, 1981? Um, so, you know, 40 years, 40 years later, but let's not do that with some of these things that we actually are doing, but we have to have that middle structure somewhere. It can't be just up in the, in, in the rhetoric and it can't be down in the, in the grassroots at the ad hoc level. Okay, I've overextended, thanks. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, I am gonna take one more question here because uh, we do have to let our panel members go to carry on their, their duties uh, today. So the last question we have here that I'm gonna address is, how do we address partnerships with nations and organizations which do not follow our system or values? I think it's a very interesting question. Have any of you encountered such a thing? And if so, uh, you know, how, how were you able to address Mr. that? Mr. Kurt, I think I missed part of that. Do not follow what? Um, uh, do not follow our U.S. systems or values where we do not have the same shared values, how do we deal with those partners? Or how do we develop that partnership? Yeah, so um, again, going my very niche uh, area mm -hmm. of, of focus on the nuclear front. So like we run into this challenge a lot with the lockdown of, of um, nuclear materials. So, you know, I mentioned the nuclear security summits where, you know, we really did have this incredible uh, cooperation around the world. Uh, to secure vulnerable nuclear material. Uh, and we've, you know, gotten so successful at that, that, you know, we're going after like gram quantities of it. But the, the caveat is we are only doing that in the areas where cooperation, where, where the political will to cooperate exists. And so there are, you know, significant um, um, holdings of fissile material around the world in countries that aren't interested in cooperating with us. And without naming any names, um, you know, one um, particular geostrategic villain comes to mind. Um, and so we, you know, we have to, we have this challenge of how do we engage uh, in a country with a country that is otherwise almost completely inimical to U.S. priorities and, and values and try to find common ground on something as basic as, hey, you know, nuclear terrorism threatens the entire world for, you know, for the reason I'd specified earlier that, you know, a nuclear weapon that goes off in London or Tokyo or New York, it almost doesn't matter in terms of the effect that it will have on global governance and the economy and whatnot. So, you know, trying to find common ground, often not at the political level, but at the, you know, technical level so that we can continue to maintain dialogues and technical exchanges with a country's scientists and you know, um, national laboratories and so on, even if their political leaders are hostile to the United States. So, you know, that's something that we we very much try to continue to do despite the, you know, waxing and waning of, of relationships with those countries. Over. Yeah, I, I just want to say on this, because um, I've seen it come up a lot, you know, partners is one of those terms when we use it colloquially amongst individuals, we generally imply a fairly friendly relationship. Um, internationally allies are friends partners are people we just have a shared interest with on something and so you know bear in mind what the shared interest is if if that's all there is to it don't try to push your relationship further or invest yourself in that relationship further than the the specific area you're there to work on i, I think beyond that i, I really uh, i've been doing a lot of afghanistan lessons learned lately and you know, there came a point there where we, we can't care more about our partner's success than our partner does. Um, somebody asked earlier, like, you know, the question of before Ukraine, was the United States a reliable, would the United States be a reliable partner? And no one ever asked the question, was Afghanistan a reliable partner or have the Ukrainians proven to be a reliable partner? Because we're not the only people in a partnership. You, you have to be realistic about what your partner is capable of, what they're willing to do. Um, you have to be willing to agitate them. Uh, don't don't prioritize your relationship so much that you let their bad behavior go. Um, I feel like we've done that a lot in in stabilization efforts over the years because we're trying to support a government. We tend to turn a blind eye to its failures, even though its failures are why the place is unstable in the first place. Um, much more much more so than whatever kind of oppositional force might be out there. I'll leave you I'll leave you the quote related to that from if you've ever read David Halberstam's Best and the Brightest. 
Uh, there's a point in that book where he's interviewing Paul Warnke, who was a senior official in Kennedy's administration, and then I think later ran the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He was one of the only people in the Kennedy administration, and then early Johnson, who was saying like, Vietnam is a really bad idea and we shouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole. And so Halberstam asked him after the fact, you know, why, when did you start to realize Vietnam was a bad idea? And he said, immediately at the beginning. And he said, I never could understand why a smart guy like Jack Kennedy was always going around talking about countering insurgencies when obviously we should be trying to support them. And what we meant by that is any place that's experiencing that kind of instability experiences it because it's got it coming. And you ought to be working with the people who are trying to change it and influencing them, not the people who are trying to maintain the status quo. Um, obviously, in a lot of cases, like working with a country that is, uh, you know, we're working on nuclear nonproliferation on, that's not really going to be a, a, a good choice to make. But I guess what I'd circle back to on that is, you know, maybe the most important thing is never ever, ever compromise yourself and our government's values and our country's values. Um, even when you know that your partner is doing a lot of bad stuff, and even if maybe you're kind of actually hoping some of that bad stuff maybe works, it will never end well. And it will never end up reflecting well on you. And it will never actually end up helping that partner down the road. Uh, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for that. I appreciate it. Unfortunately, everybody, that is all the time we have for today. Um, on behalf of uh, the Strategic Engagements College of Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict here at the Joint Special Operations University, I would like to thank our panel members for their discussion today and to all of you in the audience uh, for your participation and putting those questions forward. So thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Dr. Kurt Herrig. If you have any questions, you can get my point of contact information and I'm happy to respond. So thank you each and one of the panel members. Thank you audience members. And that's all I have for you today.